Good afternoon, friends. Coming alive to you from Scott, um, Scott Salz's old office. Um, today's Monday. Um, so just to uh, give you some historical context as you'll be watching this, when I'm in San Antonio for the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society and also the American Academy of Religion. Um, yesterday, many of you were in the congregational meeting. And so regardless of which side you came down on in terms of vote and conversations and perspectives, I don't think this is a happy day. I think this is a sad day in many ways. Um, so I do want to recognize that. And in light of that, I'd like to um, really thank all the people at work during this process, because I know that we have several elders who are in the class, uh, whether Tim Garrett, Eric Wheeler, Brian Lindman, Kevin Twitt, and also Webb Younce. If I'm forgetting some people, please pardon me and let me know next week. Um, but just wanted to, and also not just these uh, five individuals, but innumerable others who have been praying, praying throughout the process and really kind of bearing the burden of one another and just really in, in so doing carrying the law of Christ, so uh, fulfilling the law of Christ. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been a, a difficult process for me and Mickey as it has been for all of us and it, it may continue to be that, but at the same time, one thing that we know as we've been studying through the book of Revelation together is that whatever tribulations and trials and, and so on, tragedies, and there is also the sovereign protection and provision of God. So with that in mind, uh, let me pray for us. After I pray, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to answer, at least articulate these nine questions that have been raised in my absence yesterday as a result of the recorded talk. And then I'll attempt, and the key word being attempt, to answer some of them, and then we'll get to chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. So let's do that. Gracious God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are ever near us and with us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that promise that I will not leave you as orphans, but I'll come to you in the Holy Spirit. So we thank you for the ongoing ministry of Christ's prayers. We thank you for the 12 years of faithful public ministry of Reverend Scott Sauls, who has proclaimed the gospel in a faithful fashion. And also we pray for all who are involved, have been involved in the process, who are affected more acutely by it, whether the Saul's family and also uh, numerous uh, staff, past and present, uh, who have been affected by it as well, and also the session and members of the presbytery and the special committees, and also many congregants who have been praying for uh, the outcome that thy will be done. So we thank you that it has been done and a chapter has been closed, though not without some ongoing confusion or need for clarification, and through it all, in need for prayer and in need for community building. So we pray for all who are involved in the work of the ministry here at Christ Press, that your hand will be upon them, especially during this season of uh, Thanksgiving and also Advent and how poignant those uh, words are, especially in light of what we are going through as a body together. May you have special mercy upon all of us in this time and also be with us as we look to you uh, for your guidance because this is your word. Though cryptic and symbolic and in many ways impenetrable they may be, but we know that your word is the truth. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so Lynn Shores, the, the uh, administrator extraordinaire of our class, typed up these questions and sent them to me. And I will shield the identity of who raised these questions because I may not attribute them rightly, but these are the nine. The first question is, should we all expect to be martyred? So the background of this is that Revelation chapter 6 has uh, um, this very, very important uh, discourse or comments of two groups of people. One group of people uh, was those whose lives were... Um, uh, ended, because, slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. So in light of that, I believe there is this question, should we, all be, should we all expect to be martyrs? Should we take that submissively? And then I believe it was Webb who might have kind of uh, broke that, broken that down, uh, that question down into three different constituent parts. One, uh, how do I anticipate what my martyrdom might be like in light of Revelation, or can I? Two, is the expectation for me imminent? 
something that is just around the corner perhaps, or some other time that I can't anticip anticipate? And thirdly, should I just take it without resistance or how should I respond? So first of all, um, should I expect to be a martyr? And the answer is an unequivocal yes. Let me say that again. To the question, should I all expect to be martyr? The answer is an unequivocal yes, because we need to understand the word martyr, martyros and so on, is to be a witness. So whether alive or dead, whether in 65 AD in, in, in Roman uh, kind of Colosseums or in 2023 in Nashville, Tennessee, followers of Jesus are to bear witness to the resurrection glory of Christ and the fact that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are called to follow Jesus. And also, um, as it says in Philippians 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 29, that we have been called not only to participate in the glory of Christ, but also to suffer for Christ. So bearing witness to the resurrection glory in this world means that, as Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So throughout the New Testament, as well in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, there are these references that are inexcusably and also inexorably clear about the fact that the people of God in this fallen world will embrace and expect certain challenges in their life. Thus, the term martyr, so to that question, we should expect to be martyrs in terms of bearing witness to the glory of God, whether then being a martyr directly leads to a physical cessation of life here, aka death, I do not know. Uh, at the same time, uh, is that something that is imminent? I think I might have shared this uh, to, for, for us with you all in, in class. I do think that the um, eschatological framework, eschatological meaning expectation regarding the end, the eschatological framework for a lot of first century Christians was something that was relatively imminent. So they were, they were really expecting the end of times. It is not that God's word has misled them. However, there is a sense of urgency and imminency that are dynamically present in these texts, whether some of the dicta from Jesus or Paul and so on. So I do think that there is that sense. However, we are living in 2023, which does not mean that God's word is untrue, which does not mean that the sovereignty of God is somehow lapsed, but it is kind of causing us to really kind of ask those questions and trying to read the, shall we say, tea leaves of history in light of some of these apocalyptic texts. I recognize the tension that is there. The second question is, am I putting myself out there as I should? That's a great question. Harvest is great, labor, laborers are few, this person asks. Am I doing my part in reaching the unreached? The answer to that is, since I don't know who that is, I don't know uh, whether you're doing your part in terms of reaching the unreached. But, and also that question is, am I putting myself out there as I should? I do think that we're called to follow Jesus wherever we are, whether it is in Namibia or in Bolivia or Nashville, Tennessee, or Glasgow, Scotland, or Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, you get the picture. Wherever we are, we are called to follow Jesus, and again, bearing witness to the glory of God's resurrection and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. So, um, and I think, you know, that's the question that only you can answer. Am I self-consciously avoiding situations where I can speak about or embody the gospel? Let me say that phrase again, embodying the gospel. I think that is really crucial. It is very easy for us to preach and teach. It is very easy for us to do Lectio Divina or my, my um, you know, his, um, my utmost for his highest and other kind of, you know, uh, devotional tools and so on. But embodying that gospel, embodying that forgiveness, embodying that grace is something that's going to be a lot more challenging. Um, and we know it from our own life circumstances in many ways. So that's uh, the answer to the second question. Am I putting myself out there as I should? Uh, I think the question should really be, am I following Jesus self-consciously in every arena of life? I have a friend who said, you know, he prays, Lord, where are you going today and how can I follow you? And he happens to be an academic, he's a professor of political science at Vanderbilt, and he's probably not going to go to a mission field, whether in the Middle East or Mongolia or Central Africa, and yet at the same time, I do believe that he's following and seeking to uh, follow Jesus all the way until his own earthly departure. 
Third question, does not, uh, it says, does not, does not mean that we should not work against evil when I do pick a fight, when I see injustice, when should I be a bystander? Okay, I think this person is asking something like, their evil structures and evil systems, evil practices, evil kind of, you know, behaviors and beliefs, uh, we as Christians should not be just acquiescing to them, and so we should do our best to um, employ certain means and methods to speak against it, uh, to live against it, and so on and so forth. And the question for him or her in this case, um, when should I be a bystander? So how do I know when to participate? How do I know when to join the rally for whatever cause? How do I know, and as this person says, when should I be a keyboard warrior? I don't know that phrase, but I think it means something like writing you know, blogs or social media and, you know, kind of posts. And um, again, I think it is, I don't want to be kind of, you know, uh, uh, one size fits all and says when you have, you know, certain things only for these causes should you, be, should you be involved. Again, the Lord will lead us to his own truth in that way. God's own truth, not your own truth. Well, number four uh, says early church Jesus' followers only took up arms against soldier cut off ear. I think this person is referring to Peter cutting off the ear of Malchus, who was the uh, servant of the high priest. And it says there was reprimanded. Yeah, Jesus actually reprimands Peter saying, you know, what are you doing here? You know, I didn't ask you to do this. And he said something like, you know, do you not know that I have authority to call upon the legion of angels and they'll come and fight the battle, but right now is not the time. So I think one of the things that we need to uh, recognize is that, that there's been a sort of a dissonant practice. And that is, it seems pretty clear to me that the early Christians, because of various circumstances, uh, they were a uh, pacifist, that they did not engage themselves in participating in the Roman soldier, uh, join a Roman military, and so on and so forth. So I think, and then somehow it began to, and I, you know, people have said things like this, that the church fell asleep in the bosom of Constantine. Emperor Constantine, who officialized Christianity as part of the Roman Empire's official religion, subsequently making it the official religion of uh, the Roman Empire, made Christian uh, martyrdom to stop. And, and as a result of it, some have said the church's purity began to be waxing and waning as a result of that. So uh, then it was fashionable, it was possible, it was theologically kind of justifiable for people to join uh, the military ranks and so on. And you can also look at the example of the Old Testament Israel. You know, they were called to f uh, fight the Lord's battle. I think there are some kind of hermeneutical challenges and questions as to whether uh, any church can say we are the Old Testament Israel redivivus or come back to life. But so I I think throughout history, there have been this strand and real presences of pacifist traditions and people. So for example, in the Reformation period, there was a group of Christians called the Anabaptists, uh, or AKA modern day Baptists. They said, you know what? The, the follow, to follow Jesus all the way means that we shall not take up arms and we shall not, we shall create our own separate community and we shall not baptize our children. And so that, and they literally paid with their life. And one of the things the Shalai Time Confession, Michael Sattler, he said that even if a Turk or even if a magistrate were to come and arrest my family and attack my family, I'm not going to resist. So it really raised some really profound questions about that. And later on in the 17th century, in the English context, so the Anabaptists were uh, in modern day Swiss and Southern Germany. So you come to the next century in the 17th century, uh, John Bunyan, for example, the, uh, the author of this faraway uh, classic text and bestseller called Pilgrim's Progress, he suffered incarceration because of his belief. And he also felt like, you know, Christians ought not be fighting in wars and so on. So there's all of that, that pacifist tradition. So uh, that did not mean that they didn't fight their spiritual battle. So fighting a war, and, and so as Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's, I think, more than anything else, the exegetical and theological justification for the pacifist tradition. Again, I'm not endorsing one way or another right now. I'm just explaining as a historian. And as a historian, I have often uh, kind of found refuge in the fact that I could talk about he said, she said, they said, without really, because students have a, always asked me, Professor, what do you think? I said, you know, what really matters is what they said. So um, with that caveat in mind, um, num the, 
the fifth question is we do have to take a stand. I mean, this is more of a comment. We need to be parents who stand up to whole standards, even if unpopular. Others throw arrows at us. Have we gotten watered down? I guess that is a question for her. I think it is her here in this case. Have we gotten watered down? Sometimes we can't see the difference between Christians and non-Christians. So I think there, there are these warnings that are, you know, in the, in the last days, you know, it'll be the love, love of many will grow cold, as Jesus said, and Paul also kind of warns against that. But I do also want to remind us that the last times have been experienced by every generation that has interpreted scriptures. Every time they encounter these sacred texts, they felt that maybe we're living at the end times. So again, it is not, doesn't make it untrue, but I think maybe it is for every generation to experience it and encounter that of their own. Now, we, I agree with, um, with, with her that we do have to take a stand, and sometimes I... I don't know about you. I'm not making any judgment about you. I can't tell the difference between me and a non-Christian in the way that I think about a number of different important matters. So, number six, violence we see all around, including Nashville. It won't end until Christ returns. Nashville isn't Mayberry anymore. So, um, I was a little bit culturally kind of obtuse. So I was like, what is Mayberry? So, I googled Mayberry and it's the... Um, what is it, Andy Griffith show and that uh, kind of fictional place? So Nashville isn't Mayberry anymore. So I think um, I I don't know who this person is that said this, but um, again, thank you for teaching me something I didn't know Mayberry. So Nashville isn't Mayberry anymore. So then that posits this idealism about the past. So sometimes we tend to say things like this, you know, in the good old days. Well, in the good old days, well, were those good old days really that much better than today? I, I do realize that violence we see all our, yes, um, you are 100% right. I think this is Kathy. Kathy, you're right, 100% that the, the mass shootings have increased in terms of, you know, frequency and the scope and, and, and the number of, uh, you know, uh, um, killed victims have increased. So violence is all around. And I also agree with you that um, none of these kind of, you know, violent acts will not actually kind of cease on its own until re Christ returns. It is in fact true, not only of gun violence, but also of domestic violence, also of sexual assault, also of bullying, also of, you know, a rampant, you know, frauds and pornographies and breakdown and ruptures of our relationship. All of these things will not be ultimately righted until the return of Christ. That's why I think, but at the same time, as I think one of the persons mentioned, just because it won't end until the return of Christ does not mean that we acquiesce with just whatever is going on and said it won't stop until the end no i think we're also called to participate as covenant uh, uh, partners as co-creators with god as uh, we are we are created with the image of god that means that the cultural mandate as we see in genesis 1 26 through 28 lead us to conclude that we have to participate as human creatures as those who are specifically and specially endowed with the imago dei that means that we are called to participate god has outsourced his work to us Say, I want you to do my work because you are in my garden. I want you to till it. I want you to cultivate it. I want you to subdue it so that you can rule over these things in a pacific and peace-giving and peaceful reign of God. So I think that is what we are called to do, even though the world is fallen, even though not all of these things will be righted until the return of Christ. All right, so we're kind of taking our uh, uh, turning the corner here. Okay, so number seven, spiritual formation of the ne next generation. Hymns don't lie to students about what the Christian's life will be like. Philippians 1.29. So let me just read Philippians 1.29 for us. I do think that this is um, a very, very salutary reminder. I think this person works with students. Um, it says that, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. So for this uh, person, that spiritual formation of the next generation, hymns actually speak beautifully about the delight in Christ, the delirious joy of being with Christ, but also suffering in the name of Jesus. Songs help tell the truth. We should give children room to have doubts and fears. Things she says, and she also says Revelation 6 is hard. No kidding. I mean, of course it is hard. And seven is not any easier. And, and I, was, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a PCA minister, and he said to me, why are you doing that? Man, you should have stopped after those seven letters to the church in Asia. I said, you know what? 
is called stupidity, but also seeking to be faithful in season and out of season. So Revelation 6 is hard. And Wendy, you're absolutely right. We should give children room to have doubts and fears. Yes, I think this is very, very important point. You know, a great part of learning and educational process, as I've kind of learned in the last quarter century of being an educator, is asking good questions, even if we may not have all the answers. Asking good questions, even if we may not have all the answers. I think it is important for the church to recognize that I'm not the answer. Now, we're, we're, we're never called to be, I've never said I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Then our task as the body of Christ is simply serve in that sort of sacramental role of pointing, as sacramentum means literally a sign. We are signs pointing to the reality called Jesus Christ. So uh, students, uh, and we, we need to have students and adults to have room for doubts and fears. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to have fear. But let's turn our attention constantly to Jesus in the way we do. We must remember that Christ's righteousness is given to us. Amen to that. Uh, Jesus helps us to face any difficulty, including this collective co uh, and communal and ecclesial difficulty we're facing here today. Um, and this last one, this person said, in America, historically, Christians have not suffered for their faith, but our time is coming when even doing the right thing might bring persecution to your door. Um, doesn't seem like a question. It's a, it's a comment. And I can uh, say, yes, I think that is very true. I think it is really important to recognize that each generation has faced its own fair share of challenges and obstacles and opportunities for embodying the gospel. Again, I hope that we can remember that particular phrase of embodiment, embodying the gospel. Okay, well, that's my feeble attempt and seeking to at least acknowledge that these questions are raised. I don't know if I answered any of them, but at least I made some bumbling effort to do so. And again, pointing us to Jesus once again. All right, Revelation chapter 7, then, shall we? It's about 144,000 sealed, as well as the great multitude in white robes. So just some lighthearted topic right there. Okay, and we're going to read it right now, and I'm going to give you some time I trust that by the time you watch this video, you will have read this text together, all 17 verses of them. And I want you to know that chapter 6 and 7, as when John had these visions and wrote them down, there were no chapter breakdowns, there were no verse kind of versification, happened much later in the medieval context. So we know that this is part of the same thing. What I do want to say is that at the end of chapter 7, when it talks about God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, that is a very important literary and theological truth and a literary device. That means that there will be two other parts parts down the road in the rest of the book of Revelation that signals to us that God is actively and uninterruptedly involved, even though it may seem that God is on the losing side of history, but God is not. And this is a very important signaling of that. So let me ask you this question. What do you think of God's judgment of the world? What do you think of God's judgment of the world? That question as we have seen in chapter 6, had two very different trajectories and vectors of response. On the one hand, there are people who are wanting that judgment of God, and namely those whose lives are taken away from this world because of their faithful witness martyr, uh, being martyrs for Christ. Their lives are um, you know, um, unexpectedly taken away, maybe expectedly, uh, because of their incarceration and witnessing for the, the resurrected glory of Jesus. So on the one hand, that group of, Christ, of faithful whose lives are taken away, they want divine judgment. They want divine kind of, and it says in chapter 6, verse 10, how long, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. You are not only holy, but you're also true. So how long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Once again, calling upon God and only God to be the avenger. Not I, but you, sovereign Lord, holy and true, you need to intervene. So if for this group of people, there's a desire for divine judgment. Second trajectory is that, that, that for, for some people, that uh, the chapter, sixth chapter talks about in verses um, 16 uh, and 17 and so on. The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everybody else. They are scared. They would do anything but to face the sovereign Lord, holy and true. 
So um, for them, it is a scary reality. So when you think about when you, the viewers and the, those in class today, when you think about the judgment of the world that God will eventuate in God's perfect timing, does that give you a sense of assurance that God will right all wrongs, wipe away all the tears that this world's institutions and individuals could not wipe away? So do you have that desire and yearning for it? Because if you do, you are in the right group. It's sort of like this. And for some of you who says, no, I'm not like that. Well, I want to remind us of this uh, wonderful local theologian by the name of Michael Card. He's a great singer, and I've always benefited hugely from his uh, theological teachings, um, kind of uh, versified and put it in music. He has a song called Jubilee, and I want you to, if you can, just Google Michael Carr Jubilee, and there's a really beautiful, beautiful theological statement that he makes. And it goes something like this, when you look into your judge's face and see your Savior there. Jesus is your Jubilee, he says, Jesus is our Jubilee, and says, when you look into the judge's face, the judge who is coming, and see that this judge is not just judge who will actually cast you into the lake of fire, but in fact, he has been there, he has embraced the, the, that hellish uh, divine retribution of justice, and he has come out of it as the resurrected Lord. Therefore, you see your Savior there. So, and it is important to recognize that in the, the theme of judgment that is ripe the way through uh, the book of Revelation has two components. In the same way, just as the righteous martyrs were calling for divine judgment, yearning for it, at the same time, there was these uh, who were actually running away from it. That there is a kind of dual aspect to it. Let me concretize it in two ways. One, when you think about the book of Exodus, the event of Exodus, it is dually, one, Israel's salvation, Two, is, uh, Egypt's judgment. It brought up a new life for Israel, and it brought about a death, deathly situation for Egypt. Judgment serves as a redemptive purpose, not only in inviting the wayward and disobedient to a repentant and renewed relationship with God, but also vindicating the way of the martyred, misunderstood martyr. So with that in mind, let's take a look. So again, six and seven are kind of continuous units of the vision that John has. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, chapter seven, verse one, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. So some have interpreted verse one to say, uh, you know, this is about like global warming and so on. And, and I, I mean, I, if I'll send the outline and it'll have the footnotes. I don't want to go on recording and calling somebody out as, you know, that's, I don't think that verse, verse one is about global warming. It's not because the angels are kind of preventing the wind blowing on the land or on the sea or any tree that, that this verse actually is directly talking about what we are witnessing in 2023. I don't think so. In verse two, then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the angel seal of the living God. He called out on, in a loud voice to the four angels, who have been given power to harm the land and the sea. So it, it is a, a macabre and, 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 and a very, very kind of desolate scene, isn't it, right? Do not harm the land or sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of, of our God. So it is really kind of, it's, there's some kind of impending kind of disaster and a judgment on the earth. But then the angel says, no, no, wait, 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 wait. There are people who need to be spared from this. So then this is the origin of this kind of tribulational theology, right? And we will have much more to say about that when we get to chapter 9, but I'm flagging the fact that it is here, that, that some saints will be kind of lifted up or, or shielded from, uh, from this kind of coming tribulation. And what kind of tribulation is it? When is it? And, and how will that manifest itself? Um, we're not sure, but it does seem to indicate that there, there's this kind of divine protection, even amid a lot of catastrophes and disasters. And I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. So let's stop right there. And that's uh, verse 4. 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Some have, so this has been a, historically speaking, an, an interpretive landmine. Because now, whether to interpret this literally or not, or figuratively, and how to think about the tribes of Israel, and why is the tribe of Dan not mentioned, and all of these things, if you actually care to look deeply, there are all of these questions that are immediately present to a judicious reader or any kind of observant reader. So, how, what do we do with 12,000? 
And so 12,000, so 12 as a number of perfection in many ways. And, and then what you have is 12, uh, um, and then you got uh, uh, 10,000, uh, uh, 1,000 as, as 10 squ uh, cubed. And so that may be one of the ways to thinking about 12,000. Now, the question I've always had is this, and I don't mean to be cheeky about it at all. Did John actually see these 12,000? Could he actually enumerate and say, yeah, there is 11, he was numbering them 11,999. Oh, one more, 12,000. Or was he given that information from, from his angel or was it the spirit of the Lord that revealed to him? I'm not sure. I, I'm not taking it any less at face value, however. I do think that the Word of, the word of God is infallible, even if I don't understand it. So, uh, the tribe of Judah, and so it seems to kind of st uh, stand for the totality of the people of Israel. So, then one of the things that will come up as an, a very, very important theological kind of a, 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 a dividing of perspectives is do we think of Israel as a, as a, um, as a special kind of a, a, a place and role that they are given in redemptive history in eschatological terms? Meaning that will Israel, as Paul says in Romans 11, uh, 35 to 37, uh, 25 to 37, uh, 25 to 27, excuse me, then, then all Israel will be saved. Do we need to interpret that in a way that actually takes seriously um, that... Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's Romans 11, 25, and 26, and 27. The key text meaning uh, being verse 26. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So do, is it right for Christians to expect a special role that will be assigned to Israel? In the same way as Paul develops a mini theodicy in Romans 9 through 11, he says, I wish I myself were cut off from my people because I am deeply distressed by the fact that my people, the people of Israel, had rejected the messianic figure named Jesus when he came. And he sees through the tunnels of history, as it were, and, and sees and, and declares that then all Israel will be saved because when the final number of Gentiles have come in. So let me back up. Both for Paul, a faithful Jew, and John, a faithful Jew. And as Christians, as we, as we kind of enter into this interpretation of the New Testament, we need to realize that both John and Paul were deeply steeped in, in Israel's scriptures. And, and, and the kind of hermeneutical interpretive patterns and paradigms that they have inherited as followers of, of Yahweh, right? And so there is an existing kind of a Jewish interpretive kind of uh, perspectives that must be. And that's why I think, you know, he's not talking about some Gentile 12 tribes, that this is talking about the 12 tribes of Israel and then 12,000. So as you can perhaps tell, then I'm interpreting the number 12,000 more in a, in a figural or symbolic fashion. Therefore, I do not conclude that it's only the 144,000 alone who will be saved because there are some uh, um, kind of, let me say this very gently, wayward interpreters of, of this text um, and one of the groups that, that, uh, of them being uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses who have said that this is actually, this means that only 144,000 uh, will be saved. That seems to me to be a very, very tragically misleading reading of that text because uh, then you, the immediate problem is then in verse 9, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Is that so, and we're going to think, uh, talk about that. Is that a different group that you cannot count? The first group was 144,000. The second group was, you know, innumerable, uncountable group. Some interpreters have said that the first vision and the second vision, namely the 144,000 and the uncountable group is nonetheless the same kind of description of the same group, perhaps. But I, I'm not in any way forced to conclude that only literally 144,000 and them alone will be saved because if my math is right, I do think that there are more than 144,000 Christians in human history so far, right? So that seems to militate against that. Maybe uh, some others may disagree. I don't know. So, um, so then, then, then he sees those who are sealed and those who have received that divine sealing Protective seal are that all the, uh, the, the tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000. That in the, in the religious imagination and the vision of John, a faithful first century Jew who met 
the Jewish Messiah named Jesus. I think his framework is going to be from the angle of the Israel, uh, Israel scripture as well as uh, the Jewish uh, uh, kind of interpretive uh, perspectives. That means that when they talk about the 12 tribes of Israel, that's the sum total of the historical and actual existence of Israel. That, that means everybody and, and all the persons that were in that, in that uh, um, uh, recipients of divine election. All right, let's move on then. And I, 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 I can tell right away, I mean, as I'm, even as I'm speaking this, that I myself will not be that happy was telling uh, my good friend Lyric Fesco that I'm one take limb. I don't like re-recording things. I do it one time and I'm done because if I were actually live in the class right now, I could not redo this. I teach it one time and I have to kind of be live and ask and, and field any questions. So let's look further in verse 9. After this I looked and there were before me a great multitude and no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes. Huh. Have you seen that before? White robes. Where did you see that? It actually, if you want to go back to chapter 6, it says, Then each of them were, was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer. So it is this group of faithful witnesses of the resurrection glory of, God, of, of, of Jesus, the reign of God that has been inaugurated and that has not yet completed, that there are these, and they are actually, they were the people who are wearing white robes, and they're holding palm branches in their hands, and they crowd out, cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Did you hear that? Okay, and remember, I talked about this, right? Every time that there is a description and a description of divine identity, it's going to be someone on the throne and the Lamb. And we see that again in verse 10. They cried out in a loud voice, these martyrs who were given this white robe that stands for, and notice this, that, that this is, they were given the white robe that were actually washed by, washing the blood of the Lamb, right? And we'll see that later on as well. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So is that God? Is, so this is a very interesting thing. To our God, is that our God who sits on the throne only? Or is our God's identity also applicable and applied to the Lamb as well? Now that's a very, very important binitarian kind of question, right? Not Trinitarian, but because John was in the Spirit. So he was experiencing the Spirit, uh, this whole vision in the power of the Spirit. Therefore, there is an emerging Trinitarian perspective and experience that John has right here. And verse 11, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. Sound familiar, right? The elders and the four living creatures and their angels. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Again, this is a beautiful scene of worship in the middle of tribulation, in the middle of these things that are happening. And I think it is very important, perhaps a very, very apropos reminder for all of us, that when you think that life is going just in a in, in, in a terrible direction, life isn't going the way that you desire, we need to take a look at this heavenly scene of these angels falling down and worshiping God, saying, Amen, and, and praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. So then, in verse 13, one of the elders asked this very important question. These in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? And I don't know about you, but I crack up every time I read verse 14. John answers, sir, you know. I mean, like, John could have answered it, but he just kind of deflects it. It's like a Johannine deflective kind of strategy here. And I think it is rhetorical strategy because, and then he said, these are, there, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore... They are before the throne of God and serves Him day and night in His temple. And notice the language of temple. This is a very, again, you need to understand something about this, the kind of first century or second temple Judaism. So r both the writings of Paul, indeed, all the quotations, biblical quotations that all the New Testament writers make, they're actually from the Old Testament or the Tanakh or Israel scripture. So it's, so John says, you know what? Uh, who are they? And then this elder, uh, one of the elders answers it for John because what John says, John deflects it by saying, hey, you know the answer. Don't ask a rhetorical question. And they are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes. And then they're before the throne of God. And it says, he sits on the throne and he will shelter them with his presence. And notice this language of immense comfort. See, the thing is, 
the Bible does not soft-pedal neither the real presence of tribulations and trials and tragedies, nor does it soft-pedal the real presence of divine comfort and divine presence that God Himself, the Lamb who had been slain. And it is really important for us to kind of put both those things there and say, we don't know how to square this particular circle, but we know that God does and God will. So look at verse 16, never, will, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst, because they have hungered, they have thirsted, the sun will not beat down on them as it had before, nor any scorching heat. So one of the kind of beautiful expressions that I find here is that the very things that used to really torment them and really kind of have this adverse, adverse effect on them, whether it is hunger or thirst or the natural elements, uh, they will no longer be the impediment of their earthly journey because they are no longer on earth, but they are in heaven awaiting the consummation of all the programs and plans of God. And notice in verse 17, it says that for the Lamb at the center of the throne, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So notice the, 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 the twin kind of role that both the lamb and God will play, right? And the one on the throne. So it's the lamb who is at the center of the throne. It is earlier spoken of someone at the throne, and it's a very interesting kind of vision, interesting linguistic expression of what John saw as, as a way of kind of really kind of describing the singular role that the resurrected Christ, aka the Lamb of God, both in terms of John, in John's gospel talking about, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When John sees Jesus, that's his identification. And here, similarly, that Lamb is also um, is, is a code word for the resurrected Christ or Christ himself. That, that therefore raises the theological ante considerably more. How can, a, how, can, how can Israel's Messiah be God himself? Now, it is not an exceptional or completely unprecedented perspective. There were some strands within some early Jewish thinking about messianic identity that, that kind of lean close to the messianic figure being divine or God, Yahweh himself, and there are a lot of these kind of strands of interpretation that, that vie for different kind of uh, uh, um, attention. So we have actually come to the end of the chapter. And so I've kind of went verse by verse, and one thing that is really important to see is this, that in chapters, in chapters six and seven, we have seen stories of you know, uh, natural disasters, we have seen stories of people saying, you know, fall on us and, and help us to be uh, away from the presence of God. We have also heard of these righteous, the voice of the martyrs who say, you know what, how long, O oh Lord, how long? And then we have seen this, you know, the, the, the first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth seals that really un, un, unfurl onto this earth these disasters and difficulties and, and stories of death. At the same time, at the same time, there are these kind of scenes of praise that recognize, cause us to, to say, wow, God is alive and active. That in the middle of much tribulations and tragedies, God is not abandoned, God is not defeated. It may seem like God is in retreat, but God is not. And, and we need to be reminding ourselves of that beautiful and sobering uh, fact that God is on the throne. And I want to close with these words from Psalm 46, as I've been reflecting on this for some time in the last few weeks. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. That language we have seen in Revelation chapter 6. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. And notice how it ends. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. That means that God's going to judge the earth ultimately and eventually, and where all of these weapons of mass destructions will have no more any use. And he says in, in verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. With those words, 
I'd like to leave with you. And may the Lord continue to strengthen you and sustain you, not only today and the rest of our class time, but also all the rest of our earthly days of journeying toward the city of God. So I let, I'd like to ask the elder who is in charge of the classroom discussion. And first of all, thank you for those wonderful questions. I will seek to answer them when we get together uh, on the 26th of November when we have moved to one service and uh, we will have that uh, study session at 10.30, I believe. So thank you very much. Blessings on you. Bye.